60 days, as happens so often on this particular day of the year, but it, 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 it means a lot that you are willing and interested and committed to be back here for this time of Bible study. And so I thank you very much for your willingness to be here with God's people tonight. Isn't it good to be with God's people any time that we can be? Amen. Amen, indeed. Beautiful time of singing, beautiful time of Bible study and prayer, strengthening up our bonds and our relationships, encouraging each other to good works in the kingdom of God. Did you bring your Bibles tonight? Let me see. Hold them up, please. Good. Uh, this is Q&A night. For those of you that are visiting, that's uh, pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, people, uh, our, our members submit questions. Uh, FH reminded us where those boxes are, so I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for doing that today. Uh, anytime you have a Bible-related question, um, whether that be about the text itself or perhaps an application of the text, uh, put them in. It'll give us a great time for some study. Uh, here on this third Sunday night of every month. Uh, if you would, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is where our first question is going to take us tonight. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you I have three questions prepared. The last one that we're going to talk through is um, one I wanted to be able to spend a little bit more time on because it, it does have a, a little bit of a sensitive nature to it. Uh, but we'll begin here with this question tonight. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 23... What is the last sentence referring to when it says, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come? Which day is he referring to, or which day is it referring to? Now, that rendering comes out of the, uh, the, the King James, I am assuming. Uh, I normally read out of English Standard. We have some other versions. So just for, uh, just for thoroughness sake, let's a uh, little bit different reading in verse 23. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. <clears throat> Anytime that you come across an individual phrase and you want to, and, and this is just a general encouragement, a general good practice of Bible study. Anytime you come across a, an individual phrase and you're kind of curious, well, what exactly does he mean? Let me give you what I believe is the best practice to finding the answer for that. Back up several verses. Grab the context. Make sure you understand what's happening in the greater context first. Uh, a lot of people have found themselves in, in theological problems, theological trouble, because they read a phrase and they said, oh, well, that, that fits exactly what I already believe. The problem is that in the context, it didn't actually say what they wanted it to say. So let's try that here. Let's see if we can get anything out of the greater context. If you were to back up to the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, you find a context that has often been called the limited commission. Um, and... and there, it, it's possible, Bible students are not 100% agreed upon this, it's possible that this is the same account that Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 9 speak about, but Mark 6 and Luke 9 give some different, a little bit different details. Matthew focuses on Jesus sending out the disciples, the specific, what we will later know as the 12 apostles. Luke actually says it's 72 different disciples that would have presumably included those 12. But the reason why we call it the limited commission is because, well, it happens before the end of, before uh, Jesus gives the great commission at the end of the Gospels. But let's just read a couple of verses here. You can kind of get the idea of what's happening. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the uh, Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, beginning in verse 5, particularly if you were to look at verses 5 through 15, Jesus is giving them the specifics for that particular mission of what he's about to send them out on. And, and I would say if there are two words that describe Jesus' um, instructions, I, I think two good words are simple and urgent. 
It's a very simple mission, but he wants, he wants his, his disciples to go out and, 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 and bring about this idea that you need to act upon this really, really quickly. There is a sense of urgency. Uh, and notice just a couple of things that Jesus says. Uh, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That would also be one reason why we would call this the limited commission instead of the great commission. Who is the great commission to? Go there unto all men or go to every nation. This time, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's not ready to reach out to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. He says, go to the Jews only. Uh, okay, we're picking up verse 7. And proclaim to them as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without paying, acquire, acquire no gold or, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out what is worthy, uh, who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy... Let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or that town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So you, you get the idea of what he's telling them to do. Go in, be prepared, uh, only take what you need for the day, essentially. You're going to rely on the generosity and the hospitality of the towns in order to receive your food and to receive the supplies that you need. And, and if, if you find a worthy home, they're going to take you in and they're going to receive this message. And if they don't, if you extend your greeting or he says you extend your peace and, and they don't receive it, then reach back and take it, in other words. Okay, if you can actually take back your peace, but you understand what he's saying. And then you move on to the next ones. Now, what's going to happen as a result of that? Well, as they go in there preaching this message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's coming, the rule of God is coming. And as they do all these miracles, there will be people who don't like what they're talking about. There will be those who don't like the miracles that are happening. Didn't, didn't Jesus already have that happen? And so in verses 16 through 24, you're going to find him describe the type of persecution that they are going to find. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So you need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my name's sake, and to bear witness before them and to the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Father, uh, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake." But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Now that sounds pretty intense, doesn't it? And that's where we're going to focus our thought here in just a moment. But, but just so that you have it, that takes you through, uh, uh, that, that takes you through a portion. One of the things that I want you to notice about 16 through 24, but also, and this would continue on, okay? Uh, he will go through the rest of this chapter. And if you have chapter headings in your Bibles, you probably see something that kind of, uh, summarizes what's happening in 26 over the next few verses. He tells them after all of that he described, all this persecution, being dragged before courts and, and all of those awful things, what does he tell them to do? I want you to cower in fear about this, right? No. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of all of these things that you're going 
to encounter. What I tell you in the dark, you say in the light. And what you hear whispered, you proclaim it from the housetops. And then he'll go on in verse 34. He says, because you also need to understand the point of this mission. Jesus said, don't think that I've come to bring peace peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, I don't think Jesus means at all that he means to bring a literal war. I think what he's pointing out here is that this message is is going to result in the fact that houses are going to be split over what to do with Jesus. And we see that happening even today, do we not? In parts of our world, there are some people who were raised with a certain religious belief and when they accept Jesus, when they they come to a belief in Him as the Messiah, what winds up happening? They get kicked out of their home. And on some level, you see that happen in our society, even here in the United States. You may find someone who who comes to a belief in Jesus and they, uh, they, they accept His grace through obedient faith. And then all of a sudden, everybody they hung out with all their life, all their family members, they're not able to be in that same crowd anymore because they don't fit in anymore. I think that's what Jesus means here. And then finally, he'll give in verses 40 through the end, verse 40 through the end of the chapter, the, the, the notion of the reward that's coming. Whoever receives you receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. So what's going on here then in chapter 10, verse 23, that drops us in the middle of the, or right there at the tail end of 16 through 25, puts us in that that spot where Jesus is giving them the statement about the persecution after he's given them their instructions. There are two possibilities, as best I can tell, of what's going on. So remind, remember again, he says in verse 23, you will not have gone through all of the towns, uh, all of the towns of Israel until, before the Son of Man comes. Well, number one, we have the possibility if we're going to stay in the immediate context, which was the limited commission, we're going to say, well, the Son of Man coming must have meant that there was some sort of judgment that was going to come upon Israel in the context of this limited commission. This is not the Great Commission, but the Son of Man coming is typically understood as, well, judgment, right? He's coming, He's going to bring judgment from God, and there's going to be maybe something catastrophic that happens against the people who did not receive this message. Now, contextually speaking, it would be a good guess to say that He means that they literally would not have gone all the way through Israel with this limited commission before some judgment comes. Here's going to be the one major problem with that. We have nothing to indicate to us that that there was a major judgment that happened on Israel at this time. There's no real historical reference outside of the Bible to tell us that God brought uh, some, that, that, that would indicate that maybe God brought some judgment upon the Jewish people at that time. Uh, we know that many, many years later, A.D. 70, comes kind of the ultimate judgment on Jerusalem with the fall of Jerusalem to the Roman Empire, it sees the ceasing of the Mosaic Covenant completely, or at least the, the shattering of it to the point that they can no longer continue practicing it. But, but that doesn't really seem to fit. You know, there, there's nothing that would indicate to us that there was a judgment before this limited commission finished. So then it gives us a second option, which personally I I lean a little bit more toward. Um, uh, By the way, and I I need to make this observation too. There are some people who have taken this passage to mean that Jesus' second coming has already occurred. That that we're living in a time period in which Jesus' second coming already happened and it was connected to these events. That's not possible. Okay, it, it is it is biblically not possible when you consider the things that the rest of that, that the rest of the inspired writers do throughout the remainder of the New Testament. So I don't think we're looking at something that was going to happen immediately in Jesus's day. Here's the other option. The other option is a little easier to document. In that what Jesus does here is he begins by giving them the limited commission sends them out on a simple mission. 
But knowing that there's going to come a time when these same 12 apostles are going to be given the Great Commission. He's already kind of visualizing ahead to the type of response, the type of struggles that they are going to encounter as they go out for Jesus. Now, if you think about what he says in the previous verses, it's a lot easier to document the type of persecution that Jesus refers to during the Christian age, does it not? They are going to drag you before courts. Uh, let's see, where was it? Uh, verse 17. They will deliver you over to courts, flog you in their synagogues. You will be dragged before governors and kings for my name's sake to bear witness for, before them and to the Gentiles, except you're going to bear witness to the Gentiles, but what did he just get through telling them not to go do? Don't go to the Gentiles. So I think this fits better. I think what Jesus is doing is he's kind of giving them a preview, if you will, of what they're going to encounter as time goes on. And as you read through the book of Acts, you find that these men encountered that very thing multiple times, over and over and over. And so in my mind, the, the best explanation that I can find is that the language Jesus uses here is to emphasize the entirety of Israel. When he says, you will not have gone to all of the towns of Israel, I think he means you will not have seen all of Israel converted before that final judgment comes. That's my take. Let me read you what one commentator said. In this context of, of post-resurrection ministry, however, it is better viewed as a reference to the perpetually incomplete Jewish mission in keeping with Matthew's emphasis on Israel's stubbornness. Christ will return before His followers have fully evangelized the Jews, but they must keep at it throughout the entire church age. In my mind, that fits better, that all the towns is language Jesus is using for post-resurrection ministry and whether or not the entirety of the Jewish people would have been evangelized with the gospel. And that's the best I know what to do with it. Uh, it's an interesting question what exactly he means by that, because we don't have much more beyond that. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say that that's probably the best possible explanation for Matthew 10, verse 23. Second question is this. How were you to know who was a true prophet and who was a false prophet? As most of the prophecies were fulfilled many years after, uh, were many years off to be fulfilled. In 1 Kings 13, we read of a prophet who was tricked by another prophet. Should he believe the old prophet in return or accuse him of being a false prophet and not go with him? So I, I actually got a little tickled when I pulled this question out because the second time I've gotten a question about this specific text in just a handful of months. So I, it, it's one of those where this is a story that really bothers people. Uh, if you would, turn to 1 Kings chapter 13 real quick. And we'll, we'll take, a, we'll, we'll take a, a quick look at this. Uh, the, the, the story is, I, I won't take the time to read it, but the story is during the time of the divided kingdom, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, northern kingdom has wandered away from God. They've gone into that apostasy. And their kings keep perpetuating that idea. So God sends a prophet from the southern kingdom up to the king of, the nor of, of Israel to tell him about all the evil that's happening. He gave this prophet very specific instructions. You go up there, you deliver the message, you come back. You don't stop along the way, you don't get a bite to eat, you don't pass go and collect $200. You keep moving. However, there was a prophet in Israel, in the northern kingdom, who found out this guy had come along. And he says, oh my goodness, well, I need him to come with me. And so the older prophet goes to this young man, says, I'm a prophet of God too. And God said, you need to come spend the night with me and come share a meal with me. And the young man believed him, even though the old prophet was lying through his teeth. As a result, after they had shared the meal, 
God did bring a word to the older prophet that said, you're, to the younger one, you're not going to die. And as he leaves, he is, as he's trying to leave the town, a lion comes out, strikes the younger prophet dead, doesn't maul his body, just strikes him dead. And the older prophet is forced to send his sons and they go and they have to bury this young man's body. Well, it's a difficult one to try to figure out what, what are you supposed to do with that? You know, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be able to trust our elders, right? We're supposed, when somebody comes to me and says, I'm also a preacher or I'm also a Christian, I'm supposed to be able to, to trust them in that. So what, what was this guy supposed to do? How was he supposed to know that he was a false prophet? One of the things that for this story, for this account I, that I think is worth noting, we need to remember in this account, we need to remember that the young prophet's divine commission was to communicate God's absolute utter disdain for the actions of Jeroboam, the king of Israel. And he was also tasked with the job of uttering God's absolute judgment upon these actions. And this is why God expressly told him, do not stop, do not stop to share a meal with anybody. Just go up, do your work and come back. Because in that culture, and in many ways it holds over to ours as well, in that culture... When you stayed to share a meal, it was the act of embracing someone. And if you accepted someone's hospitality, that conveyed the idea, I accept what you're doing. I think a better question might be to ask, why was this older prophet of Yahweh still living in an area that had been so overcome by idolatry? Why had he not taken the hint that God was clearly beginning to give through other prophets? And so the, the, the young prophet's own conduct was to symbolize the Lord's total rejection of Israel's false worship. That's what his conduct, that's what his actions were supposed to do. And it was supposed to symbolize the recognition that all the people in Israel had been considered as becoming apostates. And so he should have remained true to his mission even even though this other prophet tried to get him to turn aside because this younger prophet should have understood the point of the instructions. And by disobeying God's specific instructions, he, he completely muddies the water of the message God wanted these people to understand. So how was he supposed to know the true or false prophets? Did you know God actually gave people instructions about that? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, as Moses is giving his final set of instructions to the people of Israel before his death, he actually discusses this very thing. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass... As if he, and if he says, let us go after to other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has, he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the, hand, out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you, by, redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Here's what I want you to understand. Or here's what I want you to, to get out of that. Moses told the people that here's how you understand if a man is a false prophet or not. Number one, you check his accuracy. If his prophecy comes true, then that's a really good indication that he's a legitimate prophet. The next part, though, is this. Does his teaching fit with what God has already revealed? 
Did you notice that? He may come and give you a sign and it might come to pass. But then if he turns around and he tries to get you to do something that contradicts what God has already revealed to us, then he's a false prophet. You are not to listen to him. And I think, that's a, I think those are two really, really good principles to live by, is it not? Especially that second one. We are living in a day when we don't see the, the miraculous manifestations in the way that, that these people would have seen at that time. But we do have the written Word of God, do we not? And, and we have the responsibility to study it, do we not? Because this is God's will for us put down and preserved throughout all the generations. And if someone comes along and begins to teach something that contradicts what these words say, then we are not to listen to it. Doesn't matter how charismatic, doesn't matter how good of a speaker, doesn't matter how suave and good looking the guy may be. If his message doesn't fit with what God has already revealed, you don't listen to it. That's how you know whether a prophet is a false one or not. Because it's not just one-sided. It's the, you know, the question points out many of these prophecies took a long time to come true. It's not just about that. You also have to listen to the content. Does it go against what God has said or does it match with what God has already revealed? Those are the two major things that you need to keep in mind. That's how we know if there's a false prophet among us. All right, third question. And I know it's long, but bear with me. If I do not think a man or men should be an elder or elders because of their personality or our attitudes don't agree, is it a sin? Should I leave the congregation that I love and find another congregation to attend or stay and not have honor or respect for them? Hebrews 13, 17 says that I have to obey them, not honor them. Before I get into this, let let me tell you that I... I, with a great deal of confidence, this is a hypothetical situation that is being posed. We are not facing this issue here at Highland Heights. Uh, I I made sure before I dug into this that I I tried to do some research to make sure that. So I, I feel very confident in telling you that this is a hypothetical situation, not an actual issue we're having to face at Highland Heights. But it is an issue that is faced at times in other congregations. And I understand, and and from the get-go, I want to say I understand how emotional of a question this is. This is hard to ask. And and, and any time you sense conflict between a church and their leaders, and any time somebody gets to the point in which they are contemplating do they need to leave their current congregation and go somewhere else, that's not going to be an easy conversation to have, and it's not going to be one that needs to be taken lightly. First of all, I want to do this. I want to read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, since that is the verse that is referenced. And then I want to get in and and give you a couple of thoughts regarding the answer to this question. Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So how do we answer this? First of all, let me say this. Is it a sin to have personality clashes? No, it is not a sin to have personality clashes. God created us human beings with different personalities, and He did it for a reason. Personality brings color and excitement and variety to our relationships, does it not? I mean, let's really think about it. Would you really like it if everybody had the exact same personality you have? I, I know I wouldn't like it if they all had the same personality you have. I'm, I'm kidding. I mean, my, I, I wouldn't like it if they all had my same personality. It, it brings excitement and variety to our lives. Um, and frankly, because there is such diversity of personality in humanity, I, I think it would be foolish and naive of us to think that everyone is going to get along perfectly all of the time. It's just not going to happen. With that fact, though, one of the things that is so beautiful about the Lord's church is that we are supposed to be a body of believers who are able, who are capable of overcoming those personality clashes. 
we are able to get beyond those and, and still work together in spite of our personality differences. That's one of the beauties of the Lord's church. Now, let's ask this question. Could personality clashes morph into sinful situations? Yes. Here's how. If we allow conflict to go unresolved, it could turn into a situation in where sin is committed. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you this. I, love, I was born in the South, right? I love the fact that I was born in the South. I love the, the principles, and I love the things that are associated with being born in the South. That hospitality, that yes ma'am, no ma'am, all of that wonderful politeness. I love that about my upbringing. But folks, God bless us. Sometimes it feels like our Southern hospitality is killing us. And here's what I mean. I think sometimes that Southern hospitality is killing us because we don't want to cause trouble or we don't want to hurt someone's feelings or for whatever reason, too many Christians today are living in situations in which they refuse to actually go and deal with the conflict. We leave it alone and we just don't, we don't address it. Or we come over here and we talk to somebody else who's going to side with us and we address it that way instead of going to the other person. Or we ignore it and hope that it just goes away. And what happens is, is a lot of our conflicts wind up stewing and festering and creating more hard feelings toward the person that we're in conflict with. But the Bible speaks often and clearly about how to deal with interpersonal conflict. Now, I'm going to go rapid fire with this, so if you want to just write these down and go look at them on your own, you can do that. But I want you to just listen to a handful of verses, uh, a handful of passages that, that the, uh, of God speaking to Christians about how to deal with interpersonal conflict. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others trespasses, neither will your Father, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. James chapter 5 verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Colossians 3, 12 through 13, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Romans chapter 12, verse 18, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with others or with all. Romans 15, 5 and 6, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, Finally, brothers, rejoice... Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Here's the point I want you to take from all of that. The biblical instruction is clear. The Christian's goal when we encounter interpersonal conflict is to actively seek reconciliation, especially if we find ourselves in conflict with a fellow Christian. If you or I have conflict with someone else, we have a responsibility to go to them face to face and genuinely try to fix the problem and figure out how to work toward how to work together peaceably. And we've got to learn how to deal with conflict, church. We've got to learn how to deal with it quickly and directly because this is one of the biggest potential barriers to the unity of God's people. So if somebody were to come to me, again, I told you this is a hypothetical situation. I feel confident about that. But if somebody were to come to me in real life having to deal with this problem, these are a few things that I would, I would want to ask them or have them ask themselves. Number one, what's really at the heart of your disagreement with these leaders? 
is what is it really a personality conflict or or is it possible that maybe sometime along the way you got your feelings hurt and that was never actually resolved or is there some other conflict that was never properly resolved that has festered over time to create a, a, a ongoing tension I would ask this question, does this, does this elder or minister or other member, does this person even know that you are upset and feel this way? Or are they completely in the dark because you've never gone to talk to them? Have you done everything within your power to resolve the conflict, especially including face-to-face -face conversations? And I think one of the harder questions to ask is this, what do you really want to see happen here? Do you genuinely want to get along with and respect this brother? Or are you looking for a reason to stay upset at him? Many times that's the way we're operating. We just don't want to admit that out loud. And by the way, along those lines, let me, let me add this. If the issue that we have with somebody else, if the conflict that we have with somebody else is not severe enough that I am willing to go and readily talk to them about it, if I'm not going to go talk to them about it, then I need to learn to let go of it. If it's not severe enough to warrant a face-to-face -face conversation. Because, number one, it's not fair to them to hold it over their head when I'm not willing to talk about it. And number two, it is not spiritual to hold bitterness because I refuse to do what's necessary to fix the relationship. Now, regarding Hebrews 13, 17, which we read a minute ago, the, the, the statement is made in the question here that, you know, Hebrews 13, 17 says that, that I have to obey them not honor them. To, to that thought, I, I want to say this. I'm not completely sure. In fact, I feel pretty confident that that's not a fair treatment of this passage to draw that kind of line between members and shepherds that I have to obey. The Bible says I have to obey them. I don't have to respect them. I, I don't know that, that, I, that I can agree with that, with that assessment. And, and here's the reason why. The word that in our English Bibles is translated out as obey literally means to be persuaded by. Be persuaded by your leaders and submit to them. It seems to me that in order to be persuaded by someone, you have to have, you, are, you, you must have a level of respect for them and how they think or else you're not going to be persuaded. Otherwise, the obedience, if you, if you don't respect them, but you obey them anyway, uh, what you have happening there is that it is a forced obedience that is eventually going to result in, in resentment. And you think about it, we would never be satisfied with that attitude in any other situation of life. You can hate me if you want, but you better obey me. We would never be satisfied with that. Consider, consider the husband-wife relationship in the Scriptures. You go to Ephesians chapter 5, and he speaks about wives submitting to husbands, and, 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 and as you read through that passage, here's what you find happening. He starts off with the idea of submit, but around verse 23 of Ephesians 5, he changes words. Wives, respect your husbands. So what does that show us? It shows us that respect mutually goes hand in hand with the idea of submission. And if that's what we would find in our regular, everyday relationships, why would, why, what would lead us to think that it is even remotely appropriate in the Lord's church to act otherwise? And if I may be frank about it here, and we're going to wrap up, if I may be frank about it, to, to take the position that says, well, the Bible only says I have to obey them, not honor them. It, it, honestly, it sounds like to me that, that a person who truly struggles with that would, is battling an unspiritual heart. It sounds to me like that position is one that is, that is it's indicative of a person who would rather stay bitter and angry than to try and do everything in their power to create a healthier relationship with the other person. Now again, I, I know that this is a difficult question to ask. And maybe at times, if you find yourself caught up in, in this type situation, I, I would imagine it might be a difficult answer to accept. 
And if there is anyone who is facing an issue like this, my final plea with you would be to go talk to those shepherds. Go talk about your concerns. Sit down with them about it. If you have to start with the one, start with the one. And if it's multiple ones, you sit down with a group of them. Because I firmly believe that shepherds within the Lord's church have genuine love for your soul and for your relationship and for their relationship with you. Don't sit and stew in bitterness. But as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, which we read a moment ago, aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And remember that the reason we Christians seek peace and reconciliation is because that's what God did for us. He sent Jesus to die to make peace between us and our God. He sent Jesus to be the one who was the sacrifice of propitiation, the one who appeased the wrath of God so that He would no longer be angry at us for our sins and so that we would not have to suffer the eternal consequence of our wrongdoing. God actively seeks peace with you. And if you're here tonight, it may be that you are living in sin and you are not at peace with God. Please don't take that to mean that God does not want that relationship with you. Understand He loves you. He's ready to give you His grace if you are willing to submit to Him in obedient faith. And so if you are here tonight and you need to obey the gospel and become a child of His, you have that opportunity if you are living in conflict with God as a Christian and you need to seek peace with your Creator again, we want to pray with you and for you. If you are here tonight and you are in conflict with someone else in this family or another family somewhere else, my encouragement is that when you leave this place tonight, you start the process of bringing about reconciliation for that as well. God has done everything for us. What He asks is for our obedient submission in return. What will you do with that invitation while we stand and sing?